This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today, a longer form episode. My guest, Larry Height, the famed trader. He was on just a few months ago. This is a catch up episode, longer than the last episode, almost 90 minutes. I'm not sure what will happen in editing, but nice conversation, fun stuff. I love Larry's perspective. We are all fortunate that he gets to share some wisdom and have a fun conversation. Without any further delay from me, let's jump right into the market wizard, Larry Height. Let me make an observation on that since you lead with getting older. I just watched Mr. Munger and Mr. Buffett on YouTube, and I watched a good portion of their annual shareholders meeting from the last few days. And compared to them, you're a teenager. That's true. <laughs> but there's so much richer than me. Well, you take what you get. <laughs> <laughs> what does the world think of America now? What does the world think of America? Yeah, you're sitting in Asia, right? These people have had experience with America. Really shitty experience, but okay. When I was there years ago, they said, well, we are Buddhists, so we don't hate, but we don't forget. So now the world is flipping around, and I just wonder if they still have that. I had a conversation with a guy that works for a fund that raises assets across Asia to let people in all Asian countries essentially buy their green card to America. And it's a minimum $800,000 investment. So I don't think there's any lack of demand for that. And I think even the average Vietnamese, probably other Asian countries, they still want their kids to go there for school and all that kind of stuff. And they still think that America is the ideal that they might have heard about in their youth. And I think, in my opinion, many people in Asia have not experienced on the ground, because of COVID, in many cases, they've not experienced on the ground since 2019. And America is a completely different place after COVID. They still have a certain optimism, but the direction America is going on all kinds of fronts, especially culturally, I think eventually people are going to understand what that is, and they're not going to like it. <laughs> I live here, and I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nice. I'll share something with you, too, since it's an interesting way for you to start our conversation. Look, sometimes you and I joke around about pretty girls in this podcast, but I must say one thing that I really love where I'm at right now, and whether it's a relationship or a friend, the sensibilities of the women in Vietnam, for example, they remind me of the sensibilities of our mothers or our grandmothers. So they might be a younger, attractive lady or an older, attractive lady or whatever, but they still, even in their 20s and 30s, there's a sensibility to where it's, oh, wow, there's a certain caring there. There's a certain feminine feeling there. They're hard workers and all that stuff, but it's not this strident chasm that's developing between men and women in America. Probably not news to you, right? First thing we've become, and I am certainly one person who fits the bill, very impatient. Amazon is a great example. Today, A, no one has to not have anything they want. Pretty close. And not only do they get it, but they get it fast. That is probably true. In Vietnam, too, but I can stay in my apartment and want anything I want, and it'll be there in a day. Is that good or bad? I no longer think it's good. I think what we have in that mode is we have, when you go in Miami, I do a lot of physical fit things. 
I try to anyway. And everybody, when you talk to the doctors and try, people want to come in and get the thing that's going to do it. Boom. And everybody's a patient. We have an impatient country. We have an impatient world, for all I know. So nobody has to wait for anything. Debt does not mean anything. Now, look, I'm not an economist. You know, I'm a trader. They want to make this coin, a trillion-dollar coin. I could not believe it. So what are they going to do? They're going to print more money. Well, they can't. They're kind of locked in right now. I mean, with the inflation, it's going to be interesting to see what they do if they go old school Volcker and they really kill inflation. But look, back to trend following 101, you and I can't predict tomorrow. We're smart people. We can make observations. We can look around, but we sure as hell don't know what's going to happen next. We have to prepare for whatever happens, right? I came into one of your old, you were in a rant. And you rant about how the world's <laughs> changing. I was ranting? <laughs> oh, yeah. You started out with a fake country. And so many people were this way, so many people were that way. It changed. I thought it was extremely interesting way to do it. And look, here's your deal. You could deal with this like Tom Basso. Have a great time. Or, and you mentioned my name. Well, I mean, I, he really deals with it, he puts it in a stop, and that's it. And I actually believe that having a stop is an enormously sensible thing to do. And I can't imagine people without a stop in futures. I can understand that in the stock market. Larry, they can still go to zero. Look at all these banks out there in San Francisco going under right now. I get your point on futures, but right now we're in the age of bank stocks going to zero. I don't know about zero, but yes. I was thinking the other day that anybody who doesn't have a way of getting out, I believe, I was in Cleveland, it's, it's sort of somebody committing suicide. It's back to Ed Sakota's famous line about, Everybody gets what they want. So if somebody doesn't have a stop and they're sitting there and they're taking the pain, it's kind of like some sadomasochistic thing. They enjoy it. They enjoy the losing. They enjoy going down with the ship. You know that guy from Texas? Salem Abraham. Yeah. Why did he stop trading? Oh, I don't know. I mean, he had a long career. I didn't know that he stopped. Somebody told me that. I don't have any news there, but I will say this. Like I said, I think if I'm going by memory, I believe his first fund started in 88, very young man. He might have had a 25 to 30 year track record. I'm not really sure what the status is at this moment. Oh, yeah. He had that. And to my view, is there's nothing to do with that. It's a machine. You turn it on. It makes you money. One of the things that we did see in the trend following managed money space over the, let's say, decade between 2010 until 2020, we did see some large names in trend following see their assets under management go down. Not necessarily from drastically reduced performance, but because everyone looks over there and says, hey, let me go stock, stock, stocks, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, of course, it's 2020 until today, trend following has been a wonderful investment. I think some people saw their assets shrink during that period. That could be one issue. We're speculating about any one individual we're speculating or one company. I don't know. I look at it, it's a machine. It's a really simple business. First thing, you got to be like Dixon Watts, as you pointed out. You got to train that way you can sleep. But if you do that, and that's built into the system, you don't need to do much to just say, look, take an ambulance, any bunch of averages, I don't care. They will tell you the trend. You have a choice to figure out, to say how much you're willing to lose, and you can keep a score. It's like baseball. You actually know if somebody is good or bad or having a bad breath. But I have not 
seeing people, but if you keep your bets, bets are by on the lower side, but a lot of bets, you do very well. In my observation of this, Larry, it really does. I'll go back to the the interesting thing about trend following for me has always been you could find these audited track records on file with the government, but then these are often managed money companies. Those companies, while they are producing trend following performance, they have the burden to deal with investors who might not know their ass in a hole in the ground and are pulling money in, pulling money out, and all this other kind of stuff. You know that can affect the size and scope of a potential company, even if the strategy is great. Great is a big deal. Very few people are great. But I read the Market Wizards book. So I'm Mark Menorini, and I have become friendly. But if you look at these track records over a period of time, they have one thing that I always find. It's not that I don't have losing periods. I'm mentoring a guy because he had done some shit in the military that I was interested in. So I would, he would tell me how he got through that rough trading. So, but we became friends. He had some trading methods, and they were all right. I dug through his stuff, and his systems actually worked until he's going along and he doesn't do something. He stops following the system? What he hated was when he made a profit and he lost it and ended up with a loss. Calls me up, I can't stand this. I was ahead, and now I'm down. And I said, Claude, this is the deal. You're in a boxing ring. If you're in a boxing ring, It'd be no surprise to you if you get smacked in the face. That's the other person's job, to smack you in the face. If you're in a boxing ring, you can't have a big, oh, my God, somebody just punched me in the face. You went into a boxing ring. That attitude, though, is kind of strange because it's almost like if you personalize it that much, an individual like that doesn't seem to imagine that there's other players in the game besides him. He thinks it's just him against the market, whereas there's so many players out there. I remember there was a guy who used to show up in there to get sugar prices. Every fucking day, this guy would show up and walk out. I think I might have had this in a book, but but it's a true story. I don't remember the guy's name, but let's call him Henry. When he come in every day and look at you, he says, look, I made $7 million in sugar, and then I lost it. Sugar owes me that money back. He said, now the sugar market goes on a real move, or a big move. I happen to bump with the administrator. I said, well, you must be happy. Now, why? Sugar is going up. I missed it. What do you mean you missed it? I don't know. I had a cold. And when it started, you know, I'm going to pay more. So this guy showed up. I don't know. Maybe he tried to fuck some girl in the office. I have no idea. But here's a guy who shows up, gets his shit right, and then he doesn't do the trade. What you just talked about is a personality concept. They're smarter than the market. They're smarter than everyone else. They're going to outsmart it all. And yet there are people like Kovner and uh, who go along, make a good living, a very good living. Kovner is worth about $5 billion. Let me read something to you. This is a quote from Buffett from his shareholder meeting the other day, and I think you'll like this one. And they were kind of just asking him about people doing stupid things. And Buffett said, What gives you opportunities is other people doing dumb things. In the 58 years we've been running Berkshire, I would say there's been a great increase in the number of people doing dumb things, and they do big, dumb things. I think there's a lot of commonalities between his thinking. I don't want to call him a trend-following trader because that's not what he does, but in many ways it is. He makes his money from concentrated bets that have big trends. Now, how he gets there is different than a trend-following trader, perhaps. Another line, let me find this. At this same meeting, He was talking about diversification, and Munger was calling it, now he's 99 years old, he's calling it diversification. And he said, quote, 
One of the inane things that's taught in modern university education is that a vast diversification is absolutely mandatory in investing in common stocks. That's an insane idea. People don't understand that about trend following. Yeah, you might monitor a lot of markets, but you might make your big money in any given year off just a handful of markets, which is exactly what Buffett and Munger are doing as well. They're making their money off a handful of markets. That's true. But man, they made a fortune by spreading their bets. Okay, but if the market's not moving, man can spread their bets. But if the market's not moving, what the hell are they doing? They're not trend following. You can't trade 140 markets at one time. They're not all moving at one time. Different strategies. I could trade as many things if I can get in and out. That's it. You know, come, I will have those moves. Yes, if I bet four times or 20 times my net worth and I have no stops, I'm going to die. People do not want to recognize losses. My mother was a very intelligent woman. And she was a very good card player. She used to say, well, Larry, you don't really have a loss if you don't take it. I said, no, no, you have the loss. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, my mother, when it came to numbers. Larry, after all your success, obviously your mother was alive to see you have success. So I'm sure at various points before she died, did she ever come to your side and go, oh my gosh, my son figured out this game and I had it all wrong? Or did she go to her grave thinking, oh my gosh, I know a better way than my son. This is a true story. I had a very big house in Summer, New Jersey, and the house came with a library, dark pine. I took that as my office. It was my Don Corleone office. You had a cat you were petting as well, too? <laughs> <laughs> well, so anyway, my mother comes down, my father dies, and I take her up north to the funeral, and she comes into my office. She's like 75 or something. She said, Larry, we're all proud of what you've done, but don't you think you should be in a real business? I told her, I said, well, at most things I did, I didn't do too well as a kid. I am probably the most successful person in the family. <laughs> <laughs> and if I went into the dress business, why would I leave this business where, I, where I'm making more money than anybody ever made? Now, I have a younger daughter. Now, parent, kids go to the grandparents or something they like. So my kids, my older one is like my mother. My younger one is not like my mother. She relates to my wife's mother for some reason. So the kid comes, she's like 12 years old. She sits right in the chair that my mother sat. She looks at me and says, Dad, don't you think you want to get into like a regular business? The whole generation of height family members on the female side are giving you hell. Well, not hell, but they don't know what to do. I came up with the whole concept of asymmetrical leverage. Because we had done something with the guaranteed fund, and we made an enormous amount of money. And I was sitting with these guys in England. So we were sitting, these guys went to Cambridge, Oxford, and the equivalent of West Point. And I said, you know, I've just made probably 10 times more than my father made in a lifetime. I said, I've been thinking about this. I'm not 10 times smarter than my father. You might have had 10 times better technique than your father, though. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I came to the conclusion, I made money doing this because I put myself consciously in places that I could get a reasonable bet with a large upside. And everything used to be called options. When... David Ricardo, he said, don't ever refuse an option. That confused me for years. To, I called a friend of mine in England. It was a hidden leverage note, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And the asymmetric part. It didn't matter what he was trading. Because when he said someone offers you, and I saw this in Turkey, the people used to sit in a circle. And you got up and you walked over to somebody else and said, I will give you this. 
And in the words that Ricardo uses, if someone offers you an option, take it. If it goes against you, leave quickly. If it goes for you, stay there. What's that, about 400 years ago? I want to keep it at something at your mom for a second. Not really on the trading part, but more of a you looking back part, because everyone has to deal with family members that doubt them. I mean, I've dealt with it. How do you feel at that moment when here you've had this life success that should mean something to family and they don't see it? Now, there could be many reasons why they don't see it. It could just be literally horse blinders. There could be some latent jealousy or envy, perhaps. Both of that happened, which is amazing. Mothers have an instinct. Every time I meet somebody, their kids, like uh, one of my best friends, his son wasn't a whiz at school, but he was a handy kid, so he sort of got into technology and building stuff. But one of the things he did, he bought Tesla. And his family, who my friend's a lawyer, he was a great fighter as a kid. The first thing my friend's wife said to her son, get it, get out. Because mothers are born afraid. And you can see it. When you raise a kid, the first part of the kid's life you really want to stop the kid from killing himself. Because they don't know. They'll touch the stove until they get a little burn. They just do it. I had to walk this child when he was young, and we were walking across a little bridge in Upper New York State, but it was like a 10 foot drop onto rocks. They tried to squeeze between the two, and I kept pulling them away. I said, This is very, very restrictive on the kid, but I don't want the kid to be. Four of those rocks is going to be mush. Parenting for women become the first part of his all, and they're afraid. First of all, people hate change. Larry, does this fear thing leave women? I mean, right now, after this COVID thing that happened, it really does look like to me, my observation, and I really don't care what anyone thinks of me when I say this, but it looks like the COVID operation has scared the bejesus out of women. Permanently. Many women are just permanently afraid of this damn thing. And I think society did this unfairly. Yeah. But they have a bias. Every once in a while, I meet a woman who's like an eagle. But the majority of women will fall back to motherhood. I don't know why. Yeah, there are women. There are some pretty brave women. I'm not saying it. But in general, and people. Everybody should fear for their job because machines will do a lot of things. There's a lot of work that a machine could do far better. Your surfer guy that you wrote in the book. Bill Dreis. Yeah. I wonder how many times he tinkered with his system or if he ever did. He's got it on a machine so the orders go in automatically. And did he just stay there with, like, Bill Dunn? Bill Dunn basically has done the same stuff. Long-term averages, he rides them down, he rides them up. This is the cool thing about trend following is all you guys and the guys that came before you and the guys that came before them just said to themselves, okay, hold on. The concept of the madness of crowds is a thing. Long before Daniel Kahneman got a Nobel Prize for it, the concept of madness of crowds is a thing. This is demonstrated in price action. If we know this is going to happen at unpredictable times, how can we put ourselves in a position to ride this madness of crowds when the next one happens? And that seems to be the commonality here, which is if you believe in the madness of crowds, you have an approach to take advantage of that. And you back to your rule, the Larry Height rule, you're going to believe in the madness of crowds, but you can't predict it. You're going to be wrong a lot of the times when you bet on the madness of crowds. You better have a stop. There you go. That's trend following in many ways. Yeah, no. When you said it in your rant, be like, well, yeah, they put it in a stop. But I have bought bottoms and sold tops a couple of times. And I came to the conclusion that every time I've done that, it's luck. 
I mean, because if I could do that regularly, I'd be a lot richer. Larry, 99% of the population out there, the global population, thinks because of the propaganda in education, they think they are supposed to buy the bottom and sell the top. 99.9% .9 of people think that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And they don't even know what the bottom or the top is. Exactly. Exactly. I've been thinking about people who lose their fortunes, which there was a guy named Terrence O'Neill started this, but he went to one of the big brokerage firms in California. He was doing a dissertation. They looked at 10,000 accounts and he found this strange thing. The people who sell their winnings take that profit to average down on their losers. And after that, many more papers came out. And of course, you mentioned it. There are a lot of people take the more their relationship with the market as a personal one. I had Buffett stock for a long time. I noticed that Buffett has never, ever sent me a Christmas card. Never. That yeah, did give me seven times on money, but never a Christmas card. Nothing. So I figured out the market doesn't know me, but it doesn't hate me either. It doesn't really give a shit. Don't care. <laughs> That's it. Larry, as you say that, as you say that, though, it reminds me of that first Market Wizards book. So you're in there, and Ed Sakota's in there, Rich Dennis is in there, Bruce Kobner's in there, I think Michael Marcus is in there, all these trend-following traders. Every podcast you and I have, you essentially restate that book in different ways with different stories and different vantages. I just think that most people, for whatever reason, can't accept conceptually what it is that you're saying, philosophically, because I think they think that you're just bullshitting them. They think, oh, Larry, he's a funny guy. He's just bullshitting me. They really don't get that you are telling them exactly how you think and exactly what you do. They don't get that part. By the way, you know Ed Zakota well. I don't know. So well. I mean, okay. Pretty well. I mean, he did me a very good favor one time. He's a good guy. Uh, yeah. Somebody told me that in the beginning, he was a long only trader, or he liked going long much more than they like going short. I know something about that currently, but I'm going to refrain from saying it on air. But I think it's an interesting observation. So I think if somebody wanted to go down the path of looking at a trend-following portfolio, let's say across commodity futures, and you wanted to examine the idea of doing it from a long-only bias, skipping the short trades, that might be a worthy project to go investigate. Oh, I did that. And I will tell you, you do pretty well. It's very interesting. You actually don't do well going short most of the time. But when you put the two together, you actually make more money than if you just go long. I don't know why. I wanted to take it back to something that you started this podcast with, because I mean, I've been thinking about it the way you brought it up a while ago here in this conversation, which is the culture thing. And I wanted to share something with you it sounds a little wacky. I really didn't expect to read this thread on Twitter, but I've read some stuff from this guy before. And look, I'm talking about this guy, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, clearly a psychopath and he killed people. But the interesting thing about him is 167 IQ, got into Harvard at age 15. And I was reading pieces on a Twitter thread today that someone put out there of his manifesto. It's amazing what that guy was seeing about modern culture and what technology is doing to us. He's obviously lost a screw. He's a killer, all that kind of stuff. So my disclaimers are out of the way. However, his views on technology are damn interesting and what it's doing to culture and civilization. There was a girl that I met who was crazy. I had this girlfriend in college and she was her friend. They grew up as kids in New York on the Lower East Side. What happened was this girl really was nuts, but she was brilliant, and she couldn't control what she says. She would say things, blurt them out, and they're so spot on, absolutely right. But she would blurt out these things, and they were right. 
the first time I met her, I was with this other girl. She watched it for a while, and she nailed the relationship perfectly. But she was right. I think some of these people have minds, like you and I, okay, maybe people are going to say we're smart, not smart, whatever. I like to think I'm okay smart. But I still want to have normal life experiences. I enjoy that too. But I think some of these folks that are on the spectrum, perhaps, some of these folks that are pushing the IQ level at obscene scores, I think some of them don't necessarily care about their personal life. They don't care about other people's personal life. They're in some crazy search for the truth. And only the truth motivates them or what they think is the truth. And sometimes it is the truth, but I think they block out everything else. I mean, look at this guy Kaczynski. He lived in a cabin in a hole forever. They block out everything else and just stay focused. Look, I'll share with you one time. Years ago when I did that documentary film and you appeared in that documentary film, I interviewed a Nobel Prize winner who was famous for having Asperger's, Vernon Smith. And I remember that we were setting up in his office at college campus in George Mason University in Arlington, Virginia. I was kind of new to this whole thing, and he's kind of a famous guy, Nobel Prize winner. And I said, hey, Dr. Smith, we're going to set some lights up in your office. Is it okay? Do you need to, some space or will we bother you? And he looked at me straight in the eyes, no emotion. He goes, I won't know you're here. <laughs> and that's the focus thing where I think literally some of these people have minds where they can block out all distractions. Wait, do you think Michael Jordan is not a bit of that? Michael Jordan is into athletics in a really major way. To be that good, you have to have that kind of dedication. I could have been a very, very rich man if I would have just made it mend. But I didn't. Newsflash, Larry, you're not broke. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> anyway, I just, I had an afternoon, so I, you know, figured we'd get together. But I'm really thinking that people who don't, you stop. See, Buffett, I could tell you, Buffett has a very simple system, really. Here's how this started. I'm watching television. And there was a guy, he was a Jewish guy, but he went under the name Adam Smith. He has this interview with this guy. He had a hair, but it says a little, he's kind of like a little not dressed quite correctly. He's that bizarre, but what he wears is obviously second to this guy. He's like me. I'm looking at the guy and I said, this guy is very famous. I don't know, but he's a gazillionaire. Now, I was doing pretty well. I had a this tax shelter, and I'm making like $500,000 a year in that game. And I kind of think, hey, you know, I must be somewhat smart. I said, why don't I understand what this guy is saying? I understand that he's logical, but I don't understand. It's like he's talking. Greek, and I'm talking in, in English. So I got so interested, I went out. I said, all right, I'd like to get all his trades, but I can't do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all the trades that Brookshire made. I went over every trade. I went to a value line. Basically, I figured out when he bought the stocks he bought. So then I go get the value line thing, and I begin to understand Buffett's algorithm. And you can write it out. Yes, he knows a lot about industries and businesses. Okay, so he has what they call a Jewish cycle. He thinks like a Jewish, but that kind of person would think, yeah. He looks at, first of all, as Graham taught him, he looks for the market to be irrational. That's his opportunity. And how does he figure out he wants a stock? He'll take the cash flow yield, and he'll put whatever that number is, draw a line, and then he puts the price that he's paying for the stock plus the debt. And he'll look at that and ask how many times he's getting better than the 10-year stock. That formula more or less works. What Buffett is, he's a different kind of trend follower. 
he'll go in, and as long as the business is giving him that yield, he doesn't care about the market. The market gives him a currency. If he wants to buy something, when things go down, he likes to buy things that are going to give him a cash flow steady. If the price of the stock doesn't vary to him, he likes that. In fact, when he can, he likes to buy his stock cheaper. But like anybody, though, he still needs that stock to go up. And I got a quote here also from his most recent shareholder meeting a couple of days ago. And this is quoting Buffett. We've got a business at Apple, meaning he's got an investment at Apple. He goes, quote, I don't understand the phone at all, but I do understand consumer behavior. Now, isn't that a hell of a line? I don't understand the phone at all, but I understand consumer behavior. Well, how the hell do you measure consumer behavior? Well, with the price. Yeah, absolutely. But he uses the price to buy. And sometimes he gets into deals and he gets out of them. I don't know how he does in his private deals. He's very much getting into lithium mining in California. He owns some big companies that do that. Lithium could be a very big deal. Coca-Cola is his favorite kind of stock. Think about it. I remember when Kennedy got shot and the stock market took a dive, very hard dive. And I remember thinking to myself, it doesn't matter. I'm going to buy a Coke this morning. It doesn't matter if the president was shot. Yeah, people are still going to drink Coke. People are still going to drink Coke. I want to shift it to something else that really quick while I've got you. I'm curious. I know you're home there in New York City. I've been there. And here I am. I'm in Asia right now. And I was back in the States, December, January, and I saw some things I didn't like. But how do the streets feel? I mean, you're in a nice section of New York City, and I know you like to walk. How do the streets feel in New York City these days after the pandemic? Do you feel like things are the same? Do you notice things that are different? What's your observation just on the streets? You're a big walker. I feel that I've outlived my time here. I do not understand. I am living in a world that I have no grasp of. These things about sex changes, the things of trying to get kids at 50, they say it's much better if you're going to be transgender to get the operation early. I look at what happened in the world, and I feel I don't know this world. You should come get a place over here. Seriously. You'll all of a sudden be like, oh, my gosh, this is how I grew up. It's nice over here. Well, it's safer. Anti-Semitism has really gone up a lot over the last couple of years. So my wife really is emotional about these things. Just, you know, she always says, I'm not going to a concentration camp. I said, there's no concentration. I said, you want to leave me where you want to go? Let's get an apartment in Israel. And I said, my wife, do you realize that bombs going off in stores and other places, this is not a safe place to be? I'm not saying that totally, but you go into a war zone. Do you see what's happening in France? Yeah. Let me keep you at your New York City comment. Does that mean on the streets you feel things have changed? It's not the same experience you had on the streets years ago. Sure. I mean, I lived in a working, my English wife lived in a sales. It's a working class neighborhood. I didn't think of it as working class. I just, this is where I grew up. To me, the whole thing has changed. Now, I'm a very self-involved person. I know a child, but just generally, I think about the small sector of things that I like. Then I don't think about the rest. But the world has changed. There was a crazy guy on the train. I saw that. Well, you know what? Turns out the guy actually who was crazy had fits of very niceness. His family explained he got the money. He was entertained in the subway. But he was a crazy guy. He had like 40 arrests. He had punched a 67-year-old woman. He tried to kidnap a seven-year-old girl. Who knows what's going to happen in the case? I'm not going to try and prejudge it. I will tell you what will happen. They're going to go after this Marine. He's going to go to jail. 
They'll build a statue for the dead guy. Yeah, it's insane. It's absolutely yeah. insane. And no, you want to know what I feel? I do not feel safe. And I'm used to feeling safe and all. I would think you're in an interesting position because that's a cool place you have there. And I'm sure you think about leaving it to family and stuff. But I'm imagining if I was in your shoes, I would have to look ahead and say, okay, if I leave this to family, would I really want my family living in this environment? That's a tricky thing. Yeah. It's also not as big as people think it is, too, because what happens in journalism, you should know this, is all saying in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. There's a lot of bleeding in America these days. <laughs> and a lot of strangeness. Yes, that's the part. That's why I love being here. There's not strange here. Yeah, I don't really understand. And everybody I know is not that happy about their situations. It's so wacky. What's really going on, too, from my observation, is it's essentially a battle between, let's say, I'm Gen X, you're a little older than Baby Boomer, but then it's really these generations above age 50, the younger below 30 just seems to be scared. And look, I'm sure I have some clients below 30, probably great people and stuff, but overall, it seems to be a very strange mass thinking in the under age 30, where it's like, instead of being logical and pragmatic and being tough, it's more about, hey, let's have a group therapy session nonstop, 24 and seven all the time. And that just seems to lead nowhere. If all of us are being honest, we look at these great buildings that were built in New York City and Paris and around the world in the last several hundred years, or even going back farther to the Greeks and Romans, none of this stuff would have been achieved with the namby-pamby attitude of some of the young people today. I mean, none of it would have been achieved. The people, our ancestors that built these buildings and built these civilizations, these were great people. I'm sorry, regardless of their errors and the problems they had, they were still great, tremendous, successful people. But as Jesse Livermore pointed out, it's always the people. And people do the same thing. I live on this little boy, Jesse Livermore blew his brains out. But he did. But his way of doing this, one of his things is he always had a 10% stop. So how did he use all that money? He says, the number one thing is he goes down, it's over. And Jesse Livermore, why did Jesse Livermore not use that rule? I hear you on that, but at least during Jesse Livermore's generation, there were men building New York City and building towers, whereas a lot of young people today are simply crying that they need a sex change. So it's a very different world. But we're still doing things. Our technology has moved way forward. We live in a very immature society that you get whatever you want. If you have a credit card, you can live anywhere. You get anything you want. So we have these people who don't know. I came from a, I have a rich cousin, and he had something that we were 14 and 15. And I asked my mother why I can't have that thing. And my mother said, we can't afford it. There's no debate about it. We can't afford it. We don't have that anymore. That attitude's gone. That's gone. That is absolutely gone. That makes everybody a namby-pamby. Don't forget, we are doing great things in science. We have done some tremendous work using the computers. We can make more drugs and see which works don't. AI has a very big future. We're building different kinds of buildings. Something has gone wrong, though. Something has gone wrong. I'm going to tell you right now, wrong. Feminism. I agree. 100%. When women wanted the rights of men, they got them. And guess what? They got the illnesses of men, too. You can't say to a woman, hey, you look really good, sexy. You can maybe say that to your wife or girlfriend, but you just can't say something like that. So the bad side of this feminine 
thing which people who did expect. I'm considered rich by people I grew up with. They'll always say to me, well, with your money, why would you care? Well, what do you mean why I care? Well, you, you, you might as well have a good time. I said, it's this idea of entitlement. Look what's happening in France. That's not even America. Just because they want to raise the time you get your Social Security, they're having riots in France. France is a very old country with a system of laws that they're like England. And yet they're in the street arguing because they don't have enough money. And we could see something now happen in America where America very will do a, some sort of phony deal so they can keep getting money. I mean, it's extraordinary. Let me offer a clarification, though, on the feminism part, whether it's men or women listening or both. I'm sure most of my audience is primarily men, but I'm sure there's some women that listen. You and I are not attempting to have a sexist conversation at all. But let's be honest, people. There is a huge fight, whether it's an unspoken fight or it's a spoken fight. There's a huge fight between American men and American women. And there is a chasm growing between the two. And you can see that across every aspect of life, especially in birth rates. And eventually, if men and women don't like each other, people say, oh, there's too many people on this planet. It only takes a few regressions to look at a reduced birth rate and realize what can happen to the global population. But we got this structure set up where men and women are physically and mentally equal and everybody's the same. And now we're just going to fight, 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 fight. And we're going to throw away every experience that we've had in human history that's got us to this point. And we're going to reduce the birth rate. This is not productive for civilization, in my opinion. Well, you're right. It's come to everybody's entitled. I'll give you the example. Everybody thinks they're entitled. I used to see that in England a lot. The big thing was where your family was. You were entitled. And you're not working class. You don't work. Now everybody wants it. There's a guy who wrote a book. I don't know if it was a guy either. Called Brit Think U.S. Think. The guy says, somebody walking down the street in England sees a young guy in a new Rolls Royce convertible sitting with a blonde. Great-looking girl, great-looking guy. In England, they say, he should not have that car. He shouldn't have that. I should have the car. He must have stole it, stole something from someone. Behind every fortune, there's a crime. Where in America, the America I grew up and the America you grew up. We admired that. We admired that. The crazy girl, when they were out, she had come from the Lower East Side, very poor, poor neighborhood in New York. She said to me, Larry, you wish you were born on the Lower East Side. And she's right, because in America, the dream that I grew up with, you come from nothing and you make it. My children don't have my hunger. Hunger creates imagination. Yeah. Let's say the biggest commercial thing you've ever done are these, these podcasts. You didn't invent podcasts, but you made a whole industry. But in a lot of ways, podcasts reminds me of radio. But on the radio, we had stories. When you come on my show, that's what you do. You share stories. Yeah, that's what it's about. And the stories are the way people teach. To go to your story, though, in London with the guy and the Rolls Royce and the blonde, the jealousy and the envy, when I look at American political fights now, every American political fight, regardless of what they say they're fighting about, it's all jealousy, it's all envy, and it's all it is. People have learned how to use the political system to get money. The Tocqueville book, Democracy in America, it's two wolves, two wolves and a lamb going out for dinner and asking what's for dinner. Well, guess what? It's the lamb. And so look, 
there's a problem. And I don't see a way out because people have lost that thing that you described you had as a young man where you could see the rich guy, you could see the successful guy. Maybe he got it because he was a con. Maybe he didn't. You don't know. You don't care. You're a young man. And you say, I'm going to strive to try to get there myself. And that part is missing. Some people still have it. Now, I'm not going to say all young people don't have that, but a switch is flipped. Yeah. And it's a world that I don't understand. Where do you want to live now? Go to Singapore, man. Seriously, you went to Singapore. It's hot. You might not like that, but you could go to Singapore. Literally, it's going to require no effort to move in. You just have to find a place, whatever. But you could do that immediately. It's like safe. You could just go to Singapore or Tokyo. Either one. I am living my last year, and I'm very big for my convenience. Arlene worked for me for 25 years. I have a friend whose son just graduated economics and would you have a talk with him? I get on the phone and say, how am I going to talk to this kid? And I start with a question. I said, where do you want to be in 10 years? What would your life look like? Because I'm a great believer. If you don't name it, you can't claim it. You got to do something. I believe in goals. I think goals work very well. Even though you wanted to be a great athlete, you were a pretty good catcher, but you never went on to become Yogi Berra or whatever. But the fact is, you have to have a goal. You have to have action after the goal. You just can't say, I want it. And then you come out of the air. So I'm trying to figure out, I'm thinking about, all right, I'm going to ask this question. And then I said, hold on, I'm going to ask myself, where do you want to be? Well, I kind of know I actually don't want anything. There's nothing in the world that I want desperately. I just don't. I don't care about much. I don't want anything. I think you like sharing, though. I think you like sharing experiences. I like that. I like teaching. I really do, because you also learn a lot from people you're teaching. I always used to say, if I like Kennedy, I was born in Canada and I got that wealth. If it were me, I would change my name to Riley and see what I would do. I wouldn't give the money back, but I would want to see what I did if I was in a candidate. I am, and I'm sure you are this way, I am very proud of what I accomplished. And I would not have been happy if someone gave me $20 million. Do you the same way? I will bet you you do not have to work, especially where you live. I don't have to work. And I don't even call it work. If I get on and do a podcast with interesting people, I talked to a lady recently on the podcast. She was 102 years old and she was still sharp as a tack. I had a guy on the podcast recently who was the performance coach for Phil Jackson and the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. It was a really interesting conversation. His roommate during college was Dr. J, Julius Irving. I just love these kinds of experiences that I get to chat with all these people. And look, this is not hugely profitable for me like Joe Rogan, but maybe one day it will be, who knows. But I love the fact that whatever I've built has engendered trust. People trust that they come on and they talk with me. I'll give it a fair shake. I'll be curious. I'll ask good questions. I'll stay focused. That's just enabled me to keep having these conversations while I live 8,000 miles away from you, Mr. Height. It's awesome. Yeah. But you don't have to work for that communication where, in reality, you do. But we're so used to getting things so easy. You and I, and a large portion of people, maybe don't do it. You get on a plane and go somewhere. I went and did a deal in Australia. I had a couple of names. And I wound up doing this deal in Australia. I was uh, friend of my married Australian girl, and her sister was there. She said, you just go into Australia? Because to them, it was a, a big deal. But I said, no, there's a lead here. And I just went, and then I made the deal. But the point is, I can get on a plane and go anywhere I want. Well, maybe I'm not that unique. 
A lot of people can do it. They don't have to fly to Concord. But you get there. And I think things are so easy for people that they fight over nanny pamby things. You can't say a lot of things. I have to self-censor myself in this podcast quite a bit. And sometimes I have to actually censor you because you might say something too interesting. I'll share something with you. You might get a kick out of this. So a young person that I know, I thought would be a perfect candidate to introduce to Jerry Parker. Jerry Parker, who is the most successful of the turtle traders trained by Richard Dennis. There's a lot of reasons why I thought this could be a good introduction. I explained to this young person a little bit, and I got a response like a day later. And I told them, I said, hey, one of the things you need to do is read my book on the turtles. You need to do that. I've sent people your way. I've sent some other people assorted ways, but I don't really do this a lot. I don't really try to play matchmaker. This young person writes me back and says, how long is the book? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm lifting a finger. I'm not contacted Jerry or anything like that yet. Here I am. I'm trying to be a good guy. And it's like, how long is the book? That's the younger generation where it's like, they are missing something. They're missing something. If I was told at age 20 or 25 or whatever, somebody said, hey, here's an article. And it was an article about Jerry Parker, or it was an article about Larry Hyde or Ed Sakota. And I read that one page article and I realized who these people were. And I said, oh gosh, they're really interesting people. I want to meet them, even if it's for an informational interview. And then somebody said, well, hey, I can make an introduction, but I really think you need to be prepped. Why don't you read this Market Wizards book first so you know a little bit more about this hype guy? I can't imagine uttering from my mouth the phrase, how long is the book? I can't imagine that. Maybe you want to ask people, maybe young people can explain this. If I want something, first of all, the person doesn't know much about reading. Fair enough, as a young person in high school and college, I'm not going to say I was a voracious reader either, so fair enough. No, but they don't know how to read a book. You are reading a book. I don't read that much fiction. I read to learn something. Exactly. And there is a way to actually do that. I know what I'm looking to find out, and then I say, how am I going to get this information? So what I did with the Buffett thing, I took three or four guys, I formed a group, a study group. Now, I went back and I got Buffett's Berkshire trades. I have a cousin, I see he has data about his trading. I finally made him use stuff. So he's made himself some money. I said, you don't understand. You don't check these records and understand what the odds are. And he didn't get it. He bookkeeps these records, but he doesn't ask the fucking what the numbers are saying. Do you know why I think I got trend following? I think I got trend following because I was age 24, 25 when I was first exposed to it. And I can't remember exactly what it was. It might've been the Market Wizards book, but it was because I had been through an MBA program. I was not a great student. I was bored out of my mind. I thought to myself, I'm never going to be an investor that's going down the Warren Buffett path of trying to study the balance sheets and stuff. And so the moment that I read that there was something else that didn't have anything to do with balance sheets, and there was this underground army of these trend-following traders, all unrelated and unconnected, and they didn't study balance sheets. Instant light bulb went off. That's me. I didn't even know what it was exactly at that moment. I was like, that's me. I'm going that direction. Because if they can do it, I can figure it out. If you bet by Tom bet, you're never going to lose. Tom was not a high leverage trend following trader. He was more shooting for 10 to 15%, I think. There's a beautiful chart in one of your books, Bill Dunn. Bill Dunn goes down 40%, but he always comes back. You know the chart I'm talking about. He actually went down more than that. I think he went down over 60% in one. Yeah, at one time, but he always came back. P. 
people don't realize when they see that 40% down in trend following traders, a lot of people say to themselves, oh my gosh, why did you let that trade go down 40%? They don't understand that it was a trendless period of small losses adding up to the drawdown. And that's the light bulb moment when you realize that you're shrinking the position size, you're taking small losses, you're preserving capital, it's a trendless period. And then when the trends come, you got capital and you make it back up. Yeah, because it's dulling in. You get rid of the losers. In many ways, I live my life that way. And you do. You've had 100 girlfriends since I know you. A hundred? Hold on, hold on. hundred, a hundred. Maybe more. That sounds like a high number. You're making me sound like some kind of uh, Asian Casanova. I'm giving you the benefit <laughs> of the doubt here. But the point is, you go through, and if something doesn't work, you cut your loss. And I'm not kidding. I told this story a thousand times. I learned that. Your Harry story is famous on this podcast. <laughs> you can... Do that. But I think that the Darwinian principle is a major principle of life. You either adjust or die or flounder. But eventually, though, if, if all you did is buy 52 week cards, take it right out of Jesse Livermore, and you go into the hot industry and you buy three stocks that are hot in there. So you have movement, right? And you have stocks. You will find out very wealthy. You just will. The price tells you the whole story. Because the rest of the balance sheets, I was once trying to take a company public, and the guy said to me, look, Larry, I can make this earnings yield 95 cents or a dollar ten, but I can't make it in the middle. But he's telling me, he could jack it up by the accounting. That tells you a lot about balance sheets. Can you get permission from your wife to come travel to Asia? Are you allowed to come back to Asia and visit? My wife loves traveling. She loves it. I used to say I traveled for money, and that's why I went places. But it wasn't bad, but it's not as glamorous. When you're on the road, and you've got to move every three or four days to go to the next spot. It's not so glamorous. I mean, no one man questioned what I spent on myself or they spent when we were making money. But no one said that I had a great truck. The most interesting thing about selling the product, and this was fascinating, it was that I know a lot about training. I don't know about many other things. I know what I do works. But when you speak to somebody in another language about it, it's fascinating how each culture is different. You bring up an interesting thing. Like if you came to a place like Saigon, and I'll give a little pitch here about travel in a second, but if you came to a place like Saigon here, I mean, I don't know in this current economic climate how much people want to pay and all that kind of stuff. So it might not be a great business thing, but in terms of getting an audience of people that want to listen, you'd find a remarkable audience. I'll say this about travel, and I've thought about this a lot. I think travel for the sake of travel for very short trips doesn't resonate with me at all. I tell people, and I told this actually the last time my parents came to Asia, right before the pandemic, I said, look, if you're going to come, you're staying for a month. You're not just coming and running around and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's too taxing. I tell people also that if you come to a place like where I'm at right now, you book a month, you book three months, you book six months, whatever, because it's that once you settle in and you start living, then it's a different experience. So many people have been trained. I'm not talking about you, but so many people have been trained to like, you know, a six day trip to Greece, a six day trip to Greece to travel from Asia or America or whatever sounds like the most awful experience I can imagine. To travel around the world for six fucking days? Are you kidding me? I can't imagine doing that. I want to go live somewhere. I want to live somewhere. I took a trip around the world on a jet. It cost us $100,000 a piece to do this. 
it was done by Four Seasons. And, and, well, I always loved the Four Seasons hotel chain very much, but... It's tiring. It was tiring. You have to have a lot of money to pay for this. But we now are taking a boat, and we're going to try some traveling in Europe. Instead of having changing you know, hotels, the boat will go to the place, and we'll get out and walk around and spend time there. Because you're right, you don't know much if you're in for two days. I want to live somewhere. Yeah, but that's a very smart thing. But very few people have that time. You get paid to be an adventurer. That's how you get your content. The more bizarre and interesting of a place, the more people want to hear about it. I've kept you too long. Yeah, I've got to go to work. But I'll call you again. See you later. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.